Welcome everybody to the Long Valley tonight and everybody joining us on Zoom. 
How's it going? Um, tonight we have a very special night. Uh, we're, we our guests tonight. We have multiple guests tonight, and they'll be joining us from the new creative writing um, course from UCC, and they'll be sharing some new work. And we've got a nice gang of them up here in the corner. You're very, very welcome. Yeah. But, and if anyone who's not familiar with the layout of tonight, we'll start with a little game. And we will move on to our lovely guest poets from UCC. And at the end of the night, all of you are welcome to perform on the open mic. Uh, so our five word challenge, competition. Today, look at all the books we have for a winner today. So good. So many books. Um, so you got to join in on this one. So could I have five, five of the first words that come to your collective mind? Slayer. Slayer. Uh. <laughs> Sean is absolutely weak. We have re revolution. From revolution. Plantain. Pardon? Plantain. Plantain. Shampoo. Shampoo and fizz. Plantain. 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 And was it fizz and sh what did I say? Champagne? Shampoo. <laughs> Shampoo and fizz. Okay, so our five words are Slayer, Revolution, Plantain, Shampoo, and Fizz. I'll leave you with those. <laughs> I forgot to mention the one and only golden rule. The game is you must, uh, you, you don't have to, but if you'd like to write a poem using each of these five words in it, that's the only rule and you can perform it at the end of the session and those who receive the greatest cr crowd reaction will be the winner. That's the rule, sorry, I forgot to mention. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, everybody, I'm going to tell you now that time is up for the five word challenge for the writing part, unless you want to be sneaky and keep writing until I'm asking the last person. But do we have any first readers? Um, before our first reader does for the five word challenge, yes, yes. Yeah, you're very welcome. But before the first, I'm going to ask you for two things. If you're reading your five word challenge, please announce your name or tell me your name. And second, uh, you are all the judges of this competition uh, based on your volume. Uh, so if you would really like somebody to win, please make any sorts of noises you like. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm Hannah's dad. Oh, nice. <laughs> Hannah's dad. What's your name? Ted Myers. Ted Myers. Yeah. Do you want to shout or do you want to get no, to the mic? Shout out. Okay. <laughs> the, the dragon slayer stepped into the shower to, sh to shampoo her hair. It was plantain shampoo. It was fizzy. Here comes the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, 
for the online audience right that might have been a bit low for the online audience just to let you know if you'd like to you're welcome to if we if we have you want you want to no, oh. I think it was okay. 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 Our tech uh, corner tells us it's fine. Um, anybody else? Yeah, can I get mine? Sure, go for it. Sorry, else Come on up to the mic. You're trying to look like me, she said. No, I just wanted a change of head. Well, it looks okay. It's fab. It's Slayer. Actually, I only asked for layers. But it's good. It's part of your evolution. I'm not trying to start a revolution. But I'll tell you, since you ask so nice, I cut it off because of lice. Head lice, she yelled, running up the mountain. You could have just picked a load of plantain, soaked it inside and made it fizz, shampooed it into your hair and whiz, the head lice would all flit and fly <laughs> and bid your hair a sad goodbye. But the deed is done. Too late for that. My hair is gone. I've shaved it flat. Yeah, um, Rob. <laughs> he thought about the revolution but she only wanted retribution. He ordered steak as a main, yet she would only eat plantain. <laughs> he said, let's get down with the kids, yet she only wanted to quaff all the fizz. Tomorrow he planned to see the old Sooth Slayer, but that night she metamorphosed into the Slayer. <laughs> Thank you. We have a contestant joining us on Zoom, uh, Catherine Baden. Hi, it's French. It's Badan. Um, hi, everybody. Mine is not funny. I ended up writing a little short story. So just so you know, Buffy's new gig. Buffy was sitting quietly in the outer office of the marketing department for Mac Cosmetics, and she was puzzled. She was used to being seen as the slayer, banishing vampires and other evil creatures from Sunnydale. But now, due to her ever-increasing popularity, Mac had commissioned her to name a few shampoos for their new line, Eat, Wash, Love. She'd never been involved with beauty products before, and she was stumped. I wish this were about revolution during the guillotine, she said under her breath. How was she ever going to come up with suitable names? She stared up at the walls covered in posters for the new line. Maybe something different, she mused. Fizz, like champagne. No, that's not quite right. Plantain as in fried bananas. No, nope, no good at all. Well, when in doubt, revert back to the familiar. And she finally came up with some names she was well versed in. Vampire Buffet, Demon Lair, Blood Drenched, and Slashed. Ah, perfect, she nodded. Buffy felt totally prepared. Thanks, Catherine. Keeping it online with Marguerite, please. Slayer of the straightener, revolution of the perm, plantain shampoo without the fizz, clippers, it is. <laughs> Hi, this poem is called uh, Pixels, Chains of Freedom, brainwashed with a TV shampoo. The revolution will be televised against the, the prophecy of Gil Scott Heron, slayer of data analysis, plantain of common ju judgment, sparkling fear, digital multiverse, fits subconscious, Wi-Fi advocate, broken re re reflection 
of the last thousands of pixels. Thank you. Now, I hope I can read this. Um, the most monumental thing that has happened to me was finding Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I was 10 years old, angry and bold, in revolt of the gender I was given. And then I saw this girl, feminine, yet kicking, fighting, absolutely dominating. It was a revolution in my mind. Girls could be more than kind, not floral and delicate, like shampoo bottles would want you to believe. The fizz of feminism rose within me like pink rosé. To this day, it's my favorite thing to do, my comfort blanket. It brings me the most joy. Some people love to skate, some eat fried plantains, but I love Buffy the Vampire's Lair. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alice. Hello. <laughs> Rolling. Slayer was prepared for the revolution. Armor, check. Weapons, check. Six pack, check. Makeup, check. Hair. Ah! He'd forgotten his organic plantain shampoo for his long blonde hair was in a fizz. Unruly curls would not look good on the battlefield. Cut. Take five. Hi everyone, my name is Fionn. Thank you. I've never seen Les Mis. It's a story about a revolution, apparently. But as I said, musicals were never my thing. I fell for the heavier stuff. Sepultura, Slayer, Cradle of Filth. The wisdom of screaming your feelings I learned at the tender age of 12. It requires a lot of maintenance to be a metler. The shampoo costs are off the scale. <laughs> As teenagers, we self-organized into musically distinct clans. The ravers were all listening to Scooter. Whole families listened to Gareth Brooks. A close friend confessed he liked Enya. Others blared insane in the membrane while memorizing ran random words, plantain, for their biology exam. I ate so many bananas, I was out sick from school. My parents gave me the cure, seven up with no fizz. Hello, uh, I'm Jamie. A revolution waged by an army lacking age, baby-faced, the would-be slayers keep the thugs at bay. Amazing what you can find in a web page these days, 3D printers turning farmers into armors, manufacturing arms for the rebels of Myanmar. How fortunate these things only happen far away, out of sight, out of mind, always somewhere where the plants are strange, be it where one could grow plantain or be it bamboo. We imagine haggard rebels battered, badly needing shampoo. That was us once. We should know more about this war. In this, indifference is a luxury that simply doesn't fit us. Champagne fizz on a head of Guinness. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back online with Pam Campbell, please. Um, Slayer. She revolved through the room, six feet tall and stocking feet, or so the story goes. Her hair fizzed burnt by the blood red edge of the moon, electrified by the other side of darkness in her plantain green eyes, shampooed with tiny purple flowers. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Cedric. The eyes over her shoulders, watching as she casts up, uh, sorry. The eyes over her shoulders, watching as she casts sparks on the stove. The servant knows that the gestures guided by habits will have the expected effect, that the stare below the head full of shampoo smelling hair will remain there. A scratch and a fizz ignite the gas into a small burst and the fire settles immediately. She turns around and grabs the pot filled with oil and sets it above the, the blaze. The slices of plantain remain on the table for now. The child cannot help but salivate to the idea of the fried delicacy soon to be. She might be his servant, but he knows some fits do, do not improve neither the goods nor the process. He's old enough, though, to imagine himself a slayer of the bad people in his country. The air brings the oil to temperature, and the maid drops a handful of plantain in the pot. The, the little despot grabs another handful and, too hasty, follows the movement before the maid can stop him from spilling the boil over, over himself. He will not witness the revolution going on outside. Little Black Tiger. He scrapes the kitchen corner and thumps into the fridge, zooms along the hallway, bouncing off the walls. With kamikaze moves, the wild spider plant slayer goes in for another kill, samurai swords in the paws, turns a revolution to catch the dangling young fingers spread temptingly to slice the lot to ground. My tea egg dangles in the cup, Plantain, lavender, hawthorn, scents seduce the fine feline nostrils, haw dunks into tea. Fascination with the fizz of a vitamin drink and how the pink liquid breaks his paw behind the glass. And at night, the scent of shampoo in my hair and how the foam runs down my pink skin, so vulnerable to the slice of the claw, to the suckle of a vampire, so soft to the touch. Big eyes hazy in wonder, then the aha moment of what's beneath my clothes. Suckling quest concluded, little black tiger purrs. Um, this is inspired by that film, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Have you seen it? <laughs> if you did, I hope you like it. The universe conspires to make me feel single when I see a love heart shaped pizza in littles. A revolution is happening in my heart, or maybe it's angina. <laughs> No more to our Hollywood love. I meet you in all of our lives. We are two triads in a secret affair. I laugh and slap your black leather jacket, setting off your gun, piercing through the portal into our medieval hut, dings off the metal tin, ricochets into our Rastafari days, straight through your plantain into the translucent shell of the universe and finds its way through our gothic candlelit makeout session in a graveyard. <laughs> Breaks the radio playing Slayer, our black lipstick smeared, we turn into a blur that looks like everything on a donut. Our lives fizz through the center, volcanic eruption, the bullet cracks the glass of the love heart shaped pizza. I'm unfazed. I've seen stranger things in littles. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I move along, filling my cart with groceries, almost forgetting that in this universe, I don't need shampoo. <laughs> Lauren. Thank you. You had to go to the post office to collect the package, wondering what it was. No one sends you post and you don't shop online because you work in internet security. <laughs> you don't even have a Gmail account, let alone an Amazon, an eBay, a Wish. The package squishes, soft and yielding, fat, like my feelings for you. You take it home before you open it, peeling open the corners as slow as a gourmet plantain. Corner by corner, something soft and black appears, a band logo, Slayer, a hoodie worn by me worn to bed by me with a note at the neck saying wash me or don't <laughs> a song starts playing in your head piece by piece and you push your face in and breathe in and in and feel your nostrils fizz with the citrus scent of my shampoo and then just like that you're back six years ago, and I'm beside you, about to break your e-cigarette, this new technology you're showing off to me while I skin up another spliff. Whenever we lock eyes, it's less than a second before one of us looks away, looks down, our cheeks blushing in revolution against our silence our cheeks filling with the feelings we have no words for. And even if we did, we couldn't say. And then I turn the bottle of e-juice upside down, a sticky mess, liquid all over my fingers, the table, the three skinner frame, the tobacco. And then just like that, we're back in the past and you're in the present, holding a Slayer hoodie to your chest on your sheetless bed, while I serve plates of pesto pasta to my wife and two small children. Thank you. So I think I'll dedicate this to the grandmother I, I never met. Like that itch, oh. a cork of champagne lifts, and out of me I remember the red hair gene passed down, a second hand revolution, intergenerational pull, the ochre seeping out of me a vision of my grandmother saving the piano and 11 children one of them my father while the formoy barracks were burnt down by the ira this fizz of the past has marked me like that itch you get from the plantain shampoo which is wrong getting in your head like a slayer, sick, carrying a history unseen. Thanks, Rasheen. 
What do you reckon? You've been staring at me like this since we started. Come on up and read your poem. Yeah. <laughs> I'll decide for you now. Okay. Okay. Oh. Every time. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. Plantains pose a problem upon my market revolutions. The impropriety of possible culinary misappropriation, the peculiar 21st century fizz of kitchen correctness versus Epicurean adventure. As I slice their skins with my stained Sheffield steel, will I reveal myself as a British post-colonial slayer? <laughs> Shampoo is a Hindi word, and ketchup, and pajamas. Is there any comfort or condiment or cleanliness possible absent? the guilty ingredients of history. Aww. Thank you. And you're the only one to get it. Oh, <laughs> that's impressive. It's like another category for that kind of stuff. Is there anybody else who would like to read on the five word challenge? Catherine. Confess. We are metaverse lovers, children of the revolution. Realms collide in champagne nebulae. Earth fills my lungs in sinister lair. I knight you with the pet name of Slayer. <laughs> We vibrate as two strings on a plantain tapestry, supernova lovers on a metaphysical bed, our stars fuse and fizz. In the sensuous shampoo of anything but squeaky clean love, I confess and confess my galaxy of timeless desire for you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else on Zoom? Nope. Okay. Actually, before I announce the winner, there was someone on Zoom that asked, asked us uh, what was the, the final word of the first poem that was read. I believe you read the first poem. Could you recall the um, final word of your poem for <laughs> so we can reply in the chat? <laughs> Revolution. Revolution. Yeah, but in you pronounced it much better than I did. Um, so okay. Oh, the, it's really tough one, guys. There was twenty four of you. Um. Yeah, it was, yeah. It's great. They're all fun. they're all really really good. Um, it's a tough job. Um, it was really, it was really tight. Um, sorry, I'm really conflicted. I think there was one reader, um, there's a few you really know that I'm unsure about, and I'll tell you afterwards and you'll be going mad, but there's one reader that got, um, I think, a second wave of an applause. Yeah. It's not his first time receiving one of those, and that was Jim Crickert. I must read it to claim the prize. <laughs> <laughs> everything everywhere all at once go see it if you haven't by the way it's so good <laughs> the universe conspires to make me feel single when i see a love heart shaped pizza in littles a revolution is happening in my heart or maybe it's angina no more to our hollywood love I meet you in all of our lives. We are two triads in a secret love. I laugh and slap your black leather jacket, setting off your gun, pierces through the portal, into our medieval hut, dings off the metal tin, ricochets into our Rastafari days, straight through your plantain. 
into the translucent, translucent shell of our universe and finds its way through our gothic candlelit makeout session in a graveyard. <laughs> Breaks the radio playing a slayer, our black lipstick smeared. We turn into a, a blur that looks like everything on a bagel. Our fizz, our lives fizz through the center, volcanic eruption. The bullet cracks the glass of the love heart shaped pizza. I'm unfazed. I've seen stranger things in littles. I move along, filling my cart with groceries, almost forgetting that in this universe, I don't need shampoo. <laughs> Thank you. All of this. Congratulations, Jim, and thank you so much to everybody who competed there. It was a really good one. So we're going to um I, before I announce our guest readers for tonight. I know, guys, it's all very exciting. I know. I am. I'm. Before I announce the guest readers tonight, I'm just going to share with you some quick announcements. Um, so first of all, Avail aims to maintain a safe space for writers and attendees who subscribe to the Arts Council's equality, diversity and inclusion policy. We ask participants to maintain it respectful when communicating and to report any offensive behaviour to Avail. This event is recorded on MP3 and will be available to revisit on video via vimeo.com forward slash avail. Um, as well as that, you know, it's a live event online. And as well as that, um, it's Shauna Lee Lynch is actually going to be taking a couple of photographs um, in and around the event just to have, because um, we've been going, we're almost 16 years old now, and it's nice to have a few photos. Um, so, but if anyone, uh, is uncomfortable about that in any way, just do let me know or let Shauna know and save her asking each, each one of you for consent. Um, so our next uh, on Monday, the 13th of March next month, our guests will be Julie, Jody Hollander and Adam, Adam Wyatt. Um, also, we might pass around our donation jar under the horse's head and anybody that would like to donate online, you can do that on the Avail website. Uh, please send your five word challenge poems. Where are the words? There? Uh, no? The words. No, yeah. the oh, sorry, it's for the competition. Oh, the competition's closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's for the anthology. We need one time. It's for the anthology. OK. So it's a handwritten note. It confused me a little bit. We got there. So it's for the five word volume, uh, the 16th uh, words uh, volume. And if you want to put it, the submission's closed for it. But if you want to send any of your five word challenge poems, to the submissions at avail.ie that can be um, in, uh, potentially included in that in that volume. Um, so on Tuesday, the 28th of this month, um, in the next Debarra Spoken Word event in Clonakilty, uh, the feature poet will be Paul McMahon. And that's it for our announcements. I'm now going to introduce our guest readers for tonight. Uh, before... Yes, are you and Liz? I was just about to ask if you were here. Um, Liz Quirk um, will we'll tell you all about it. Sorry, better late than never, I guess. Um, just one sec. Hello. <laughs> Hello, screen. So, sorry to just fly in like that. Um, yeah, just real rough and ready. So let's get on the right page. So, tonight you have the pleasure of listening to seven of the MA poets from the current crop of MA in creative writing students in UCC. Unfortunately for them, they've been stuck with me as their lecturer um, for the last little while. So if you enjoy their work, that's brilliant. But if you don't, it's not my fault. Also. Um, so will I just go, I'll, what I'll do, I'll introduce you all like after, one before an introduction and you come up. Is that okay? Okay. 
So Fiona's first and she looks slightly perturbed, but um, there's a great crowd here anyway. So, okay, let's go, let's go for the detail. Fiona Tracy, cool the in a minute. Let me introduce her. Fiona Tracy is a poet from West Virginia. She has earned her bachelor's degree in creative writing from Shepherd University and is currently in the MA cohort in UCC. Her writing explores women, place and identity. And she has been published in the Nagatucket River Review, Orchard's Poetry Journal, the Stone Coast Review and the Blackwater Review. So Fiona Tracy, everybody. <laughs> Fiona, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to start by reading a new poem that I'm working on that is about my father. Each time I try to tell your story, I find you are too tall. A giant too big for this world, this poem, a remnant of the old ways of a time when men would go a Viking. I know the tallest I have ever been was seated on your shoulders, an eight foot girl in a land of small men, reaching around your red beard as if to touch the world. When you were strong and I was not, we shared the easy love of protection. Daddy, you are double-sided like a silver coin, carried with me, thumbed in my pocket till I can see myself in your reflection. On one side, you stand perpetually laughing, leaning back against the dishwasher in our small kitchen made mead hall, the company and I enthrall to your tales. Then you would rub your hands together at the pleasure of your own jokes, and I would know that you were happy. On the reverse, you are full berserker, punching holes through our drywall, roaring like the Ursus Arctus, sailing a squalling sea, forever battling the world serpent of your anger. I am storm-tossed, born on choppy waves, yet hunt you like the white heart in a dark wood, seek and find and lose you in every man I meet. Not a new idea, but no less true. Daddy, I'm still afraid of you and how alike we are in the extreme heat of our unbearable coldness. When the snow falls outside my new home, I hear the soft crunch of powder compacting on powder, of a million pieces of white stillness turning over, submitting to your boots. I am not with you but I see your stride, never breaking, how the coat that always seemed too large for any human hangs from your square shoulders. For you, I will rise every two hours to shovel as you taught me. For you, I will live the old way, close to the land, close to the sea. I do not carry your cornflower eyes or Swedish name, but I'm more like you than any other that walks the earth. In another life, I was the Valkyrie that chose you for your courage, guided you to Valhalla. Long after, we chose each other again when I became your daughter. In trying to understand you, I keep choosing. I will keep rowing to you, finding pieces of you suddenly in my lips, palms, knees, teeth like fish scales, only extraordinary when they catch the light. I fight our likeness even as I embrace it as a way to you. I fight our likeness because it is our way to fight. Your anger, my anger, is my legacy. In every life that comes, I will choose you as my father. The next poem that I'm going to read is called, I am so, so sorry. Why are you always reaching for death? Why do you send your secrets 
flying out into the world on ink smudge napkins like so many shabby once white birds. Don't you have any shame? Don't you know how to smile? Don't you know how to be polite, to be cheerful, to be a woman? Don't you want me to be happy, don't you? Why do you bruise so easy? Why are your hands perpetually shaking? Why didn't you put more salt in the dinner? Why do you cry out in your sleep? Can't you see I'm trying to get some rest? Why are you so childish? Why is your head always empty of me and full of last night's dreams? Why are your lips redder when I make you cry? Why do you weep over the broken mirror and your loose shards of luck? Why can't you be prettier like you used to be? Why are you wearing your insecurities like an overcoat again? Why can't you just disappear when I look at you sideways? Why aren't you eating? Don't you know it's rude? Don't you know I like to see your mouth full of flesh? Why are you never satisfied? Why do you make so much noise when I take you? Don't you know how to be a lady? Why can't you just turn around and take it? Why won't you take that off before we go? I'm the only one whose gaze should voyage from your hip to your collarbone. Why won't you just take one hit with us? Why are you always seeking things with your eyes? Why do you make me lash out like a whip that stripes red as dawn? Why are you such a bitch? Why are you so disgusting? Why do you make me so mad? Why do you ask for it? Why do you like it? Why are you raising your voice? Why do you always start a fight? Why the fuck are you talking to me like that? Why? And the last poem that I'm going to read is just a short hopeful poem, and it's called What Fit Once. First finding you, I wear you too hard and for too long, like a pair of new shoes. At our for farewell, I thumb your forehead, cataloging your anatomy for what may come, blessing you like the priest on Ash Wednesday. Who knows, maybe our love will show up somewhere, almost forgotten, like a lost stocking or an old piece of jewelry, an ordinary thing. Thank you. Well, I think that's set the tone pretty well so far. So well done, Fiona. Next up, we have John McLeod, who is an English-born writer uh, who was raised in the American South. Um, he's, com he's completing the Creative Writing MA at UCC. His current collection in progress extends the arc of strained family life, mid-twenties existentialism, all wrapped up in grief with a foundation of alcoholic tendencies. Um, so I think that gives us, it gives us a good bit of context there. So this is a, a warm welcome to John. Okay. <laughs> Is that good? Yeah. Hello, I'm John. Um, I'm just going to read a couple poems from uh, my recent collection and then I'll end with one from my new one that I'm kind of excited to share with you all. Um, so this first poem is about a former love and I, uh, I kind of fucked everything up there. So I can't really go back to those beautiful moments we had without um, kind of losing them. So taking a note out of Terence Hayes' book, I tried to lock them in a Shakespearean sonnet, and it is called Rushed Reunions. I only feel you as tied silk swirls low, latent unfolding to fashion your form. Moonlight emboldens a bare winter glow, tracing your features from under my thorns. I don't mean to puncture your pale embrace. If only my armor were smooth and whole, perhaps I could cradle your forlorn grace before the moon suckles its selfish toll. Whisking the roar of black rippled water, tugging your soul beneath dilating waves. Our sandcastle moats are crumbling smaller along with my memories of your last days. I'll lay in cold sand and wither in shells, 
longing for moments when low tide rebels. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh. I um, this next one, so I am uh, a recovering alcoholic and one of my best friends last year, um, my partner in crime, uh, was lost to addiction um, and he was in a coma for about a week before his family pulled the plug and this poem kind of came out of that. So bear with me, please. But this one um, is for Paul. I woke up and smelled your death loitering in my nose like secondhand smoke. I think about you now and feel hope dissolve like acid in my mouth while your death waits to vibrate in my pocket. The bridge, the desert, the endless dives, our careless chaos overlapping as vodka filled the crevices like spilled paint. Just one deep breath, and I'll meet you at the ditch where we'll roll up and blur the line between antics and alcoholism like we always did until we didn't. Give me one deep breath and exhale a laugh from the passenger seat with a blunt in your hand. Give me one deep breath on your own, please. Thank you. Um, this next one is about a toxic relationship that was killing me. And for some reason, I just couldn't get away from it. I think we, we know those. Um, it's called Found in Temperate Regions of North America. Your sex is on my porch again. You always leave it there. Just like the strings of honey that trickle down the stairs. I trace you through the sunbeams, each teasing ray your touch, each breath of wind your gasp, each salty drip enough. To lure me to your shadow, I bend as you breathe out, dripping like the venom strands that slaver down your mouth. You paralyze my being and spew your toxic thread your glassy black protracting as the hourglass drips red. The blood of your subsistence, drawn from my gaping pores, before you roll and roll and roll and drape me by your door. To savor at your leisure, a gulp before you go, you weave another widow web and drain me just for show. You disregard my hollow husk engorged with my despair, and I stagger back to my front porch and see your sex right there. Thank you. Oh. All right, and uh, this next one is just about a beautiful hike that happened one time. <laughs> it's called, um, If We're Walking in the Air, are we flying? You find me in the vacant lot where my spirit hides, blown with plastic bag promises caught beneath chain link. Shattered glass and rusty nails tink beneath our boots as you steer our escape. Your steps always climbing, always up to realms my haggard dreams don't recall. But your woodland world enchants, and when scattered saplings yield to brush and bark, your grasp tightens, the knowing breeze tugs through thick forest, and timid rays illuminate your charms, like the pine cone you threw at me. I knew it was enough to be with you, to walk miles through woods and only see your legs, or your lips as you turn to check your bearings or my breath. But I didn't know we would fly. I didn't know you would take my hand and lead me in long strides above the trees. But you did. You were magic. And I was lucky. Thank you.
Okay. I'm a tiny bit shorter than John, so. Okay, so next up we have Hannah Myers, uh, who is originally from British Columbia and grew up in Glasgow. So we're having quite an international sort of cocktail effect tonight. Also a, a consumer of the MA in creative writing and a poetry student. She enjoys, adores writing, wait for this, narratives for games, flash scripts for animation, lyric writing, poetry and musicals. So tonight we're being treated to some of her poetry. Hannah Myers, everybody. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start off with Soiled Soul. The darkness molds itself around me, haunting me with your last breath, like the image of someone carefully sitting upon a small speckled rem, crushing slowly, gently, snapping like a splinter. The blood spills softly out of the feathered thing, its legs twitch in reverse sigh of relief. <coughs> I am the bird. You took me from a quiet place, a calm place, everything we had, everything we were, to now we lie in forgotten past with nothing at all. Cold winter waves crash upon my calloused skin, the pain breaking, seeping into the sea, the salt, how it stings, a bitter pain, but better than what you left me no one to replace your presence or smell without you by my side my tide washes over me diminishing me to particles to the size of sea salt hard and broken i wished your death and many lives for yours in return no one to beckon my call this is all that is left of me the ground and i conversing with soil an act that hails no relief but one whispers from your decaying tongue. And the next one is called Menu. I imagine you as a morsel while I place you inside my needy mouth, tasting you before I submerge you, tasting you before I hand your delicate scallop-like flesh over to my violent tongue as it swirls you around and around like a merry-go-round in the front of my mouth, thrashing you so wildly that your skin starts to tear and flake off, falling upon my curious gums, like autumn debris brushing against my velvet cheeks. My molars grind you into a flattened flesh, diluting you with my saliva so that you can slide easily down the dark pit of hell where you truly belong. <laughs> and this is called comfort in the castle you lie there caressing the minuscule dark particles of my brain the reminder that you were once here a constant murmur in my ear your sweet voice echoing enticing me to live better to endeavor love and hope once again your image severing my lust for life with a strewn icicle, like the ones that hang lightly from the roof of the veranda, hoping one will fall and slice through me as I slam the door harder and harder each time. To lie by your side, frozen in time with the larvae from the blowfly seems all but a dream to me, one I fantasize about daily. I would have the larvae devour my flesh, consenting the soil to make love with my OCM. The thought of our carcasses inflating reminds me of that summer. The summer we rented a bouncy castle in the shape of a cat for your birthday. Together we shall bloat and collapse, allowing our love of creatures to bounce and feast upon us. Mites, carpet beetles, skipper flies, ants, reminiscing the time I gave to you an ant farm after your first transplant. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so far so good. Okay, I'm a tiny bit taller than Hannah. Small, so we know now in comparison, smaller than John, taller than Hannah. Okay, so our next poet that we'll have uh, joining us is Gabby Dufresne. Uh, Gabby is a 
poet and a writer of creative nonfiction. She's also currently in the UCCMA in creative writing. Uh, originally from the American South, same as John, and her work focuses on the interactions between religion, sexuality, place, and acceptance. So please welcome Gabby. Yeah, it's good. Hello, everyone. Um, so I noticed kind of an interesting phenomenon with my poetry when I got here. Obviously, um, as Liz said, I'm from the American South, uh, New Orleans originally, and then Texas. Um, and when I got over here, I really wanted to write about like anything but like my my home and growing up, like anything but that, right? I tried to write all these different things, but I found consistently the only thing I could write about was my childhood and my home. Um, so, you know, I guess things have a way of coming out when they need to, and I think that's kind of what happened here. So uh, most of these poems are going to be about um, home. So anyway, uh, this first poem is called No Gold Medal for Suffering. I want my father to go to therapy and my mother to calm the fuck down, <laughs> to hug them tight, tell my grandmother she's done her part, that she's allowed to stop the chronic overcaring whenever she's ready, that hushed and deadly illness we all inherited, just like the depression. I want to denounce the Catholic Church and get a tattoo of my darling pet worm looking up at the stars and hold my little brothers and their curly heads so close to my cheek and stop them growing. Roll a joint for everyone and roll down a hill into a body of water at the bottom that's warm and not cold because certain things, yelling, cold water, we should not be forced to tolerate. I'm sensitive, God damn it. I cry when I'm happy. I cry when I'm sad. Don't say, oh, that's okay. I know it's okay. Why are you implying I wouldn't think it's okay? Stop. I know you really don't want to hurt me or slam the door. Maybe it's because you only cry after you're done with the destruction. When you start crying and the blackness leaves your eyes, I know it's safe to come out. I know you didn't mean it. Your mother probably just didn't hold you enough. Just hold yourself. Let me hold you. Instead, you're safe here. May I? I may take him and every other person who's ever hurt me and shake the poison out. No, I'm sorry. I don't actually want to be held by you. Rather, I just want you to take my hand in yours and let me press it to my own heart. Um, so this next one's called For Amy. It's about my late grandmother. The other day I was in the kitchen cooking chicken and I got hit with a wave of missing you so hard I almost couldn't breathe. I looked up at the picture and saw your face. You hold me on the swing and we smile at something beyond the oak trees, beyond the moss and the carousels. Smoke wafts past the photograph and I think there are a lot of things I didn't understand about you, but I did understand your voicemails and the love in your eyes. We sit the same at dinner time and have the same ankles and eyes and I wish more than anything you could see me today here being what I wanted to be to come back if only just to say you're proud of me. But you won't, so I just want to know for sure you belong to God now. Somewhere the leaves are always these colors, but the world is so big and I miss you being in it. Uh, this is called 5437 Canary and Just Drive, the address of my childhood home. The air is pregnant with ghosts tonight. We sit on her back porch. Mosquitoes alighting on our skin, and while the wine glasses still sit on the table, the jazz still pours from the speaker. The rain still falls into the backyard. I cannot help but feel I was born into this sense of loss. They recall his funeral song, the way the magnolia trees stood softly along the southern streets. After the hurricane and the more intimate traumas, the day you finally told them the truth. Four blocks over, the storm took half the roof away. The house is still painted green. The purple bike still slumps over in the driveway. I look into the window of my old room. Rainbows still lining the walls. The little spirit crisscrossed on the carpet, her brown eyes blinking back at me. I press a loving hand to the glass before I turn around because I can't set her free. Home is the place I learned who I wasn't meant to be. Um, okay, yeah, and to wrap it up on a happier note, um, this one's about love. It's called The Reason I Don't Write Many Poems About You. I can see us in a little white house by the sea, like columns, except not as stark or empty, on a Saturday afternoon, 
opening the curtains, having coffee inside, watching the rain fall if it's stormy, or heading to the beach, getting cappuccinos from the little truck, crouching down in the cave, playing I spy, when you found the heart-shaped stone on the shore, and I would do anything to protect this. I love you. I want this. And Sundays or Wednesdays in the winter months when the sun goes down early, under the covers, the Shep Baker record sp spinning, only getting out of bed to flip it to the B-side, and you won't have to leave, our worries far away, and there's just the rain against the window, nothing to harm us, no war, no bitterness, no, nothing of the sort in this sacred little world. There's no tragedy here, no great suffering, no crosses to bear here, we dropped them off a while ago, and it's all different this time because I wouldn't change a thing about you, no sweeping love poems, no grand production, only reality, which now with you is far more beautiful than any poem I ever could have written. Okay, so we're at the halfway point of the UCC poets anyway. Um, okay, they've all done so well so far. Kemi, are you here? I can see you. Okay, she's good. So our next reader, I'll do the introduction slowly while she's walking towards us from the back. Uh, Kemi George Simpson lives in Cork and has been a stay-at-home mom since before the iPhone was invented. She has four sons, so her house and her nerves are wrecked. Uh, she's excited to read her poetry. She doesn't get out much, so this is a pretty good occasion. Uh, poetry is a distraction for her from teenage tantrums and that ever-pressing fear of aging. Um, her next door neighbor found inspiration in one of her poems and shared it on Facebook which was a really good thing to happen at the time. Urban trees and the steep inclines contribute to her health and wealth. So here we go for Kemi. Thank you. Inescapable danger. Wasps like inescapable danger swarm into our light. The window open to prevent mold spores on bathroom tiles. Outside, the cold, dark has weakened their nest. So wasps warm stripes under the bulb, like fringe tassels, light shade vibrates. Dripping out of the shower, your gaze is fixed on the drama. We both stop, look and listen as if crossing into their deep, busy buzzing. Though you were deaf to the dying pleas, or so entangled in fear, hands and feet poised against invasion, combat mode, ready to defend mummy. Go and cover your chest, I insist, as autumn chill settles into the landing. Reluctant, you tighten towel around waist, then get dressed, too young to discern what to cherish and what to vanquish. Back from school and college, we do our chores. Furry corpses with minute limbs and incandescent wings adorn windowsills, stairs, floors, and even the kitchen sink. Like mouse droppings, we dispose of them. <laughs> So as a middle-aged woman who's been a stay-at-home mom for almost two decades, I've been contemplating the meaning of success. Um, so I wrote this little silly little rhyme about success. Um, success is driving clean through narrow, vicious bends, smooth hill starts in front of baited breaths, opening palms to give and receive, keeping fists tight to fight off need. Raising derechos, keeping your head down in dirt storms, raising derechos to force reform. Meaningful creations from simple supplies, asking for help when it's hard to survive. Investing in well-researched wild visions, humorous while dangling off cliff edges. <laughs> So this is my last poem, and this poem is about intimate care for an elderly relative. Inevitable reversal. The first time it sat upright, 
a spherical gift with fluffed up edges. Your uncertain face was shaped by the preceding odour and a dread of reprisal. This was beginner's luck. I tipped it into the bowl, dug up deep inside you, disposing of every trace. The second time, it squished into tenor lady, seat and the dimple in your left cheek. Your weight loss relieved the labour, but a bark load of toilet bowl and flushable wipes had to be sacrificed. You kept silent and still. I oiled atmospheric cracks with praise songs and you joined in, disgust, lost to worship. Subsequent movements surprised, remnant on tenor and bulk in bowl, unruly armies colonizing dress and floor and my mind, then the burning reek of pee on inner thighs, cleaning sessions squeezed in between laundry, washing up, cooking and tidying. The mini respite I offered seemed wanting compared to the usual load, but you would uncoil, patiently endure the digging and the wiping and my joyful, tuneless noise, waste, fertilizing affection, and you overflowing with a magnitude of gratitude. Okay, this is flying. Uh, we've only got two poets left, unfortunately. So Rob Worrell is next, and he's been writing poetry since he was 15. Apparently, you've been writing for about 10 years. Um, he is. Thank you. Yeah, not a bother. Uh, the check has cleared. So um, Rob is a great performer. He's performed at Debarra's spoken word events and at Poetry Town events, which led to him being awarded a uh, well earned bursary from Poetry Ireland, which is nice if you can get it, fair play. Um, this project that he had for Poetry Town was subsequently, it's evolved into a performance piece with poetry and a narrative. So we're talking about a melding of theatre and spoken word. Um, so I'll let Rob do his thing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going I'm, to I'm gonna read about four, but um, th this one's from a few years ago, but um, it's kind of about what Liz was just talking about. So it's the beginning one of that. Okay, it's called All of, All of Me. Um, it's not what I wanted that drove me forward, but I, what I wanted to feel. It's not what I knew, but what I wanted to know. It's not what I felt, but what I wanted to feel. It's not what I was, but what I wanted to be. It's changed nothing and all of me. So this, this next one is, um, is much more recent. And um, it's kind of about, it's kind of about, I, I've got a bit of a bit of a complicated background, but anyway, it's kind of about my, my late mom and about me growing up as well. So, um, yeah, it's called Go Home. Born with cleft palate, suffering more than most, her early, her early life played host to rejection and learning to survive alone. Within four walls, no loving home. As she carried me day and night, beyond adoption, could see a future more bright giving two daughters a mixed race, mixed race brother with white husband, absented black lover. She walked tall, proud and fast, ignoring disparaging looks of many we passed, taught all of those near and far, it's not who, but how you are. I tried so hard to be strong, to lean into pain, and belong, be no different, be not other, for the sacrifices of my mother. 
for kith and kin. No question, no fuss, you're just one of us. But there projected, my protected identity was only part of me. Then came the marches, skinheads attack. Ain't no black in the Union Jack. Don't be taken aback, this shift to the right makes our streets safe for who at night? So naive, no colour blind, claiming multiculturalism leaves whites behind. Coming over here, they have it made, never working, always paid, no fitting in between the ghettos, more brummy boy than Soweto, right accent, wrong skin tone, avoiding me, leaving well alone. Wherever I wander, wherever I roam, there is no belonging in nigger go home. <laughs> so this one, this one's about, um, this one's about grief and loss. Don't worry, I'm, hand, I'm ending with a happy one. <laughs> okay, it's called, it's called, um, it's called Birdsong. Hearing the wonder of it in springtime, slipping out of slumber for my morning slog, a score of turns round the same bare field, sometime bog, the start marked by planting two feathers for a father and mother gone before. As seasons turned, you thrived on a strange concoction twice a day. With supplements, you seemed more alive and energized than those healthier folk living for years half dead. Yet fate plays tricks on our minds as COVID put paid to seeking treatment in sunnier climes, not once, but twice, a month reduced to a solitary snatched week before the second bird song spent all together became our last. And one morning up with the lark, hurtling down the slipway, a running start marked by the two feathers standing tall and proud despite disruptive wind and driving rain. Then circling again, coming across a third you flourished, sorry, coming across the third. Without thinking, pushing it into the cold, hard earth. Yet on your return, you flourished, burning bright with faith and hope, blood markers down. Yet as the incessant warbling and calling came round again, your spirit weakened with that cough we could not shift with intensifying pain in legs, arms and hips. On hearing this was the last hurrah, you did not have the strength to fall apart, mortally distraught, shattered heart, calmly and courageously telling our boys across a hospital bed that our family as was, was nearing its end. Now it's not the winter that I dread, but knowing before the summer long, I'll have to get up, run wild out, taking the circle, watching in dread for feathers in the bright, shrill, bitterly sad chorus of the bird song. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. This is okay. Your eyes are like the pool at Simon's Cove, piercing the light with your blue, deep, dark and bright. I dipped my toe to test the cold and unexpected warmth, numbing my flight, pulling me in towards you. I had to, wanted to, yearn to dive right in, feet first, head strong, slip under placid waves, breathe in deeply, the waters flux and flow, drawing me down deeper, pulling at my core to dare to want more and more. So clear, tranquil and calm, wanting to build a sandy fort, protect the hidden natural pool, to be wiser than a fool, seeking refuge beyond laughter's loss, breaking the surface for breath once more, 
gasping for air, taking it all in, to be able to go under once more, drowning all that is you protected for a moment, a short while from the world as is, and thinking of you, seeing you makes for a warm smile and laughs so out loud, wanting to stay in, be there without a care, dare to claim the time, surrendering to the sublime, heart open, layered, soul caressing, empty mind, transparent in your beauty, surrendering serenely to our truth, nothing matters beyond the moment where only we exist, where sun shines serenely, moon holds the night. Moon holds the night, sky above the garden, reflected gloriously in beautiful still waters, masquerading, mesmerizing, drawing me in deep, dark and bright, piercing the light with your blue, caressing and consuming all of you. Thank you. Okay, so we have come to our final poet. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Paul and everyone at Ovale for inviting the MA. Um, you get a different bunch every year, so I think you get a pretty good survey of what's going on above the college, um, for better or worse. So, uh, for better, for better. So Alice Barry is our next and final reader. Um, yeah, here we go. So Alice is a writer from Cork. She has returned uh, to Cork, having worked nationally and internationally as a dramaturge, uh, actor, producer, writer, director. She graduated from the Samuel Beckett Centre in Trinity College. Uh, I'm too polite to say the year because I don't want to be given away your age. Um, and she's worked extensively in theatre, radio and television. She is one of the best storytellers I've come across in narrative poetry anyway. So let's uh, let's see if she can what she can do to finish this up. Thanks very much, lads. Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Liz. That was lovely. Hi. Okay. So the first one is called Willie Clancy '96, and for people who don't know, the Willie Clancy Festival is an Irish traditional music festival in Clare every year. The bolshy bollocks attracts the crowd like a herd of heifers around a trough. Thirsty for talent, they bray and holler at his jigs and reels. Around the floor and mind the dresser, hop ya by ya. Flat down and ballet up, battering to bait the band. Whooping like the lower deck on a rough cut titanic table, threatening with the weight, oblivious to impending danger. The handsome fucker flicks his hair, darts a glance to enchance as his elbow saws through the lovelorn ladies of La Hinch. Bow dancing on the strings, fingers fiddling fast and furious, promising participation to all who dare to stare his way. Beads flick from his forehead and fly through the air like a summer promise. They land with the bravery of seven pints of the black stuff, consumed down a cleavage held up by the wonder of youth, <laughs> formed by the freedom of summer spaghetti string straps. Bronzed and brazen boulders baiting braver men than that flirty, flirty fiddler from four. But he does have the beckon X factor. <laughs> Their eyes like the patrons, locked. A smirk, a smile, a wide wink. A head thrown back as her laugh sings out like a shanos of fine chances and possible dances. The dirty devil drives the session on, head down, eyes closed tight, now futile as a knife on a bowron. <laughs> Fat frog, knocked back, she's out the gap, onto the beach where the bonfire burns, bodies, bottles, cans and hormones melding. She looks to the sea, then joins the melee. Thank <laughs> you.
This one uh, is uh, called Me Too. Manhattan 95 on a J1. No cider, so cocktails are the order. Harvey Wallbanger, Mojito, Black Russian, you're not in Tyro now, Dorothy. <laughs> Too drunk to walk to the party, an exotic voice calls to them from the car, from the road. A handsome stranger in a flash car. It's Harvey the White Russian! <laughs> Tithering now, they approach. Let me give you girls a ride, he smiles. Sex on the beach, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> a slow, comfortable screw against the wall. <laughs> Splitting her sides, laughing. It seems like a good idea to hike up her skirt and dive through the passenger window until she realizes the doors are locked and he's driving away leaving her friend waving frantically laughing hysterically roaring after them me too <laughs> So this one was was uh, originally called I think I'm in love with Kevin Barry, but I changed it to after Kevin Barry literarily. That old country music was what the medical microbiologist became morbidly fascinated by. Silently she pleaded in the Ahada Hills, then made this gesture. Oh, thanks be to fuck, he'll say, with the burden lately of wandering thoughts at night. She tacitly promises to take the night boat to Tangier with him, based on the knowledge that he will almost certainly know the kind of moundy bit down the far end. Information. But what she really longs for is a companion to travel to the far recesses and see what they might find back there. Beetle bone or marvel marrow. Don't be scared. He watches over the water, asking answers of the partially dissociated. They don't have them. In her matter of no small consequence, microscopically speaking, what she means to say, if he is interested, will be, you must not ever think of that dark and glamorous place unless you are brave enough to enter. <laughs> Okay, just the last one, and it's called Lament Not I. Now my skin is worn, they no longer stare, feel no need to tease or flirt, acknowledge I am there. A passing glance is fleeting, tells me all I need to know. There is fierce anonymity in the years of growing old. But I no longer care, feel no need to primp or groom my hair. Yet, make no mistake, let me be clear, I am here. I am very much fucking here. And here I'll stay until I'm done. The battle over, when I have won, then is the time they will all weep, tear. She once was here, I knew her once, they'll cry, they'll bawl. I did, me too, so did I. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Liz Quirk and, and the class. I'm going to read their names again because the the trade-off for having so many great readers is that their their readings feel much too brief actually. So I'm sure we'll we'll come across them again, but their names again were Fiona Tracy, Hannah Myers, Gabby Dufresne, John McLeod, Kemi George Simpson. Rob Worrell and Alice Barry. And Liz Quirk, the teacher. Thank you very much. Um, 
And so I'd say, Toshin, I'm sus. I'd say, I'd say we're ready for a little intermission. Uh, we're going to take 10 minutes. And um, if you'd like to read on the open mic after the break, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave the sign up sheet here. So please come up and sign yourself up. Uh, so I'll see you in 10. Came from. You stole mine. Oh, it's yours. I was wondering. I was wondering where I got it from. It's from Michael. Oh, you know, it's yours. See you later, Miss. See you later.
find yourself uh, some seats I think some people some people uh, have left you in the break so if you if you didn't get a seat earlier do try to find yourself one now 
Two? That's a simple. Oh, that's kind <laughs> of what I was going to Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter where I go. The hast. I can hardly see with these glasses on. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start the open. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we're going to start the open mic online on Zoom with Alexandra. Line 14. Bring it on life, every precarious safe haven, every toiling accomplished goal. Arcadians, children of the pre-lunar era, your struggles, my struggles, entwining around each other. Pain sweetening through sharing, waiting through centuries of darkness for a miracle to shine. Beams of dreams escaping the narrow bars of reality. Your labored sweat, our bitter patience, dissolving our struggles into the salt of the tear. Bring it on life, every shatterable righteous law every jagged, jubilant victory. Agatho demons, children of the absolute word. Your truths, my truths, powering around each other. Eternal debt for the unjust. Eternal gratitude for the just. Lightening condemnation of injustice. Divine mortality determined to win all battles. Fiery anger sung by muses, kindling our truths into the tip of the flame. Bring it on life, every fluctuating precious bond, every undulating sweet desire. Eteroluminescence, children of the solar cosmos. Your light, my light, shimmering around each other. Distancing and cold alienation. Connecting in warm communion. Our sacred mating reflecting with wavelengths. Invisible bright frequencies, shapes and colors becoming visible, absorbing and transmitting photons, rippling our light into the foam of the wave. Bring it on life, every delicate fine spun artistry, every frenzied blissful awakening. Dionysians, children of a primordial orbit. Your passions, my passions, creating around each other. Art flooding with hues of emotions. Every aesthetic touch, guaranteeing endless splendor. Ideal voices and thoughts. Soaring like seagulls between land and sea. Carrying elevated ideas through space and time. Raising our passions into the upsurging of the spirit. Bring it on life, every vulnerable, steadfast vision, every evanescent, ultimate flight. Thelonians, children of the winged evolution. Your quintessence, our quintessence, goldening around each other. Thank you.
Thank you, Alexandra. Um, we're going to stick to Zoom because both Alexandra and Pam Campbell are in different time zones. So next we're going to have Pam Campbell, please. Thanks, y'all. Um, my courtyard window opens to American sycamore molted gray branches, flush with pale green serrated leaves stretched on my fifth floor walk up. American tree sparrows toss till it tilted back and forth. I think of Jimmy Stewart in rear window, only I have no binoculars. My hazel 2020s pan 180 degrees past wide open windows and watch twilight disappear. Trumpet scales sun splotch Brooklyn red brick sunrise teases interior movement. Fourth floor windows clothesline cranks private to public space, flaps personality. Paint stained carpenter jeans turned inside out so pockets dry, multitask in my imagination. Hourly wage earner by day, color bubbled graffiti artist by night. White bleached mended sheets sag the middle and socks one missing off balance the ends. Second floor window frames a snowy haired canary yellow t-shirted man. He leans full torso out and calls a baritone rich Ola to pass the buyers below. He keeps faithful watch, miss, misses no one. Midday, a groceries bearing octogenarian waves him Niha and bump thuds her cart up three flights of stairs. In the cool of evening, gastronomic geography draws me to window perch. Sweet, yeasty aroma of babka, onions sauteed with garlic, slow cooked frijoles, and bucatini con le sorde, oregano rosemary tanged. Trumpeter circular breeze lip trills, clean and smooth, sorrow laced lows, bridged high, our nocturne, alleluia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam. Next up, we're gonna have Sean Lee Lynch. Thanks. Um, so in Dublin Airport, uh, there is a series of billboards. I don't know are they in other places, but they're there. And um, they, they are of uh, Irish mythological women. And inserted into them is a Skoda car. <laughs> and the first two times I saw it, I didn't like it. But the third time I saw it, I had this real visceral reaction to it. And I wasn't sure why exactly. And then I looked it up and I, on the Skoda website, it said, oh we sought to represent these legends in a more contemporary way than the usual depictions. We emphasize their admirable qualities of strength, courage and perseverance. Um, so I wrote this poem about that. The Morrigan, phantom queen, goddess of battle, slaughter and death, turned rivers red with blood of men. Her black wings evoked fear in all those who felt her near. A shapeshifter could turn from crow to wolf to eel at ease. I guarantee she would have no need or urge to drive a Skoda superb, <laughs> Ireland's best large family car. Her sister, Maka, haunted battlefields, inciting madness. After combat, she collected the severed heads of enemies, Maka's acorn crop. Under another guise, she was forced to run miles, outpacing the king's horses in a cruel race she was made take at nine months pregnant. 
Well, that took its toll on the ground she folded and died there in childbirth. But not before she could curse all the men of Ulster that in their time of need, they would feel her agony for generations nine times nine. With that in mind, it's preposterously whack to put her next to a Skoda Enyaq, the best family EV. <laughs> Bridget, patroness of many things, healing, poetry, learning, driving an SUV, not one of them. Queen Maeve, she who intoxicates, vengeful, competitive, and fierce. She led armies of men into battle and bed, hell-bent in pursuit of control. I know she would not have drove a Skoda. <laughs> it's a violation of their legacy, an attempt to domesticate them, to condense to a sugar-coated version. Leave them have their fury, tempers sharp as spearheads, nerve as strong as iron. Their words and misdeeds should not be bent like reeds to recode the ohm stones of their grief. Do not file off their sharp edges to make something pretty and palatable. That's been done to us long enough. These warriors were ferocious, full of magic and power. Under fire, they raged and screamed. They did not cool to fragile glass, delicate and dainty. They had pain deeper than the Shannon, crimson blood red fury, curses on their lips, lust on their hips, could summon rain and fog, overcame the odds and showed women what they could be. But, and this is key, they did not drive Skodas. <laughs> Thanks so much, Donna. And she's off to get her bus. <laughs> Thanks so much. Brian. Brian. Thank you, though. It's okay. <laughs> this is um, a new poem, only wrote it on the weekend, so we'll see how it goes. It's called Origin Story. I am from the black bones of the earth, pressed trees of prehistories hacked from the marrow deep, brought up into the night to burn, dust from the amputation, petrifying inspiration. I am from the ribbon river wrapping the valley floor, the rock where Merlin laid his head to dream, where a martyr's artery gushes gently over smelted sulfurous stones and submarine shopping trolleys. I am from the Roman road, relentless as the geometry of conquest, scored into the hillside with Gladius and Pilum. I march its creases daily through the map of memory. I am from the crumbled castle crushed on the cliff top, the vaulted arches in its remaining ward and the bleak song of the keening battle sharpened wind. I am from the once lusty town, the pitted iron giant that beats against its hollowed out heart with an untempered fury born of unforgotten furnaces and a rusting will. I am from the chain link between decades of beads, comfort of a thorny crown, pressed patellas in a pulping pew, silencing communion, communion cleaving the mouth's trust roof. Crisp Corpus Christi processions a swivel-eyed display of bleached identity. I am from rock buns and scones, baked by walnut-knuckled hands, served with almond fingernails. I am from the siren promise of salt and vinegar, greasily hot in the wet-nosed air of winter. I ring with the liberty bell of the microwave's ping. <laughs> I am from a dad 
ground in the crush between day and night shift. The assembly line of endurance, exhaustion, duty, devotion. I am from the smell of clinging turf on his rugby studs. The muddy sadness at my reluctance to try pitch into his passion. I am from a man working two jobs when she didn't sew, or cook, or hoover the house or dare to close her eyes in sleep, for in dreaming there is destitution. Her stitching time saved mine. I am from the working class. The aspic solidarity of, who do you think you are? Be bold, but don't brag. Get ahead, yet know your place. Be brilliant, don't doubt shine. From the kindness of neighbors, the odd bob for sweets from the dwindling top of the electricity meter. I am from the dissonant, sweaty squeak of a slipping, strangled grip wrapped around a rare, resented job. I am from the grind, the graft of others, and the grateful guilt. <laughs> Thank you, um, before we continue, there's a there's space for about five or six or seven people to sit here. Uh, so please help yourself if you need them. Next on the open mic, we have David Abbott. David, is it? <clears throat> David. What? Sorry, what is? Oh, the D is way off. The D is way off over there. It is David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm David McLaughlin, and uh, not. Yeah, I was writing upside down. So, so this is my. Uh, I'm from Dublin, and I moved to Cork in 2020 from New York. I've been in New York for 10 years, and so this is kind of a, a COVID lockdown poem. Uh, said in the dreaded Abtran on the model farm road <laughs> at the call center, November 2020 to February 2021. The messy black Yara still parked outside the abandoned unit. Shrubs overtake video cameras. A chair buttresses a fire door like a bulwark against zombies. Silence travels further in the business park semi deserta along corridors of silver birch. Almost evocative of tree tunnel secondary roads in the Midi or the Spanish Costa, where we don't go. Bands of, bands of paint luminous on the home oaks of the bypassed old, made old main road. An elderly dog walker walks the circuit, car parks linked like lagoons. Her assigned daily escape from cocooning. And it is pleasant in Bishopstown to be on site taking a stroll from the call center outsourced to UK markets, discovering a path in unpruned topiary to another unit among trees. Tunnels only open for children who meet the spirit of the forest in the cartoon film my toddler watches. In a distance year with no crash, she knows the two little girls better than friends, though sometimes still mentions Seppo Eliseo Olivia, left behind Brooklyn. The winter trees remember the river sound. Underemployed all autumn in Balancholic, I watch the treetops, variegated blowing horizons from the one bench that hadn't yet been burnt down on night incursions. Reconstituted from recycled plastic, sign says, and asked, am I back in Ireland? Cork, where I'm not from, evidently. Lost the park days now, these away from desk, severely pruned seven minute piss breaks, headset, toggle on, toggle off, digital time card, headset, to come now into Blackbird territory. Bill, absolute yellow and black body dripping, black absolutely, low to the ground, under dripping trees. I listen for the river, which is continuous and prone to flood, and listen to tree sounds, which are partially ongoing, rising and falling what is ongoing intermittently heard behind and within the trees argument 
the buttress dam hidden from blue, hidden from view. It is in Dripsy, Lone Dove. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Next up, we have Roxanne. So this new baby was born an hour and a half before coming here. <laughs> um, Constance, it was the first, oh, is it? Can you? <clears throat> Sorry. Constance, it was the first name before I discovered it was a noun, that it had, that, that it had such a deep meaning. Constance calls up to continuity, to strength, to firmness, being constant in one's acts, thoughts, words. Constance is calm, sure of herself, more than I ever will be. She smiles, reassures, heals. She doesn't fail. But maybe the constance, the constance I, see, I seek lies in my so-called failures, falling over and over, trapped by insecurities, begging to be loved, ending up being used. A natural trait, it seems. Constance has a little sister, Prudence. Or is she older? I don't know. It doesn't matter, really. I tend to disregard this one. Why Prudence, when there's an inner, inner fire within me, longing for action, rejoicing with each new adventure? Why Prudence, when singing out loud, clears the silent street after the last bus is go has gone? Why prudent when a smile is a bright armor against life obstacles? Constance knows me. She's not afraid like her sister. We go along. She keeps an eye on me each and every step. Three syllables each. They start and vanish as quickly in a breath, a murmur. They dance and I feel light. I knew a cousin of them, an acquaintance, because I never make my mind to stay in touch. Perseverance. That one is proud. When she enters the room, you can't miss her. She has a mind of her own, fights for what she wants. That's why I can't keep um sorry. That's why I can't keep track of the plans she had. I'm too volatile not to move. She's a hard worker. I like strength, endurance. That's another one. She's temporary. But recently, I met someone, I mean recently, somewhere along the past five years, our path crossed. Crossed. She could be an auntie, a godmother, a maid of honor, a best friend, a teacher. People mentioned her to me. I didn't know how to deal with that person. But as it is, she stayed, became part of me without my acknowledgement. She's the final warrior the silent one the braver she completes the three others in an infinite perfect quartet which lasts forever she pushed me when i wasn't aware when i wasn't aware of it in fact she still does she wrapped the duvet or around during those sleepless and crying nights she fed me just enough so that i wouldn't fight it she li she lightened brightened the darkness one so thick it fades away only with prayer. She led me to you. She is resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's always nice to think about that, that anybody is an hour and a half old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we were here an hour and a half ago. You know? <laughs> a lot has happened since then, but not a lifetime. Um, next up, can we get a Stanley Knight, please? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I'm just about recovered because I thought Roxanne said she had a baby an hour and a half before she came. <laughs> you know, like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, I know women are powerful things, but Jesus. <laughs> so I've just finished reading um, what I think is the latest Nick Cave book. It's a, it's a series of interviews he did with a guy called Sean O'Hagan. 
and it's absolutely fascinating in in a number of different ways he's very um detailed on dealing with grief when he lost his son a number of years ago for those of you who don't know his son died in brighton he went off a cliff while on a an lsd trip um and it obviously was a shattering experience to him but he also talks a lot about his creativity and how he goes about it and i you know i really really enjoyed it so it's um somehow i'm not quite sure how this happened it just reminded me that the last poem in the collection i recently self-published is a nick cave poem not sure how that happened copies of the book are not with me tonight due in part to my lack of ability to um promote it but more likely from a lack of interest in it to be quite frank um this is called, this is this is a dark piece this is called the farewell song so and just for those who don't know i write poems using song titles so this poem is constructed entirely of nick cave song titles and it's quite dark i make no apologies for that the darkness is great it makes you look for the light the farewell song push the sky away let the bells ring that lovely creature the firstborn is dead. I sat sadly by her side in a candle-lit bedroom when my little doll's faint heart and wide lovely eyes fell away. Oh, my Lord, when the fight was over, how grief came riding into my arms. And like an idiot prayer, an avalanche of memories crushed me. Her black hair, green eyes, red dress, and the voice. Oh, the voice. That love letter could say a spell 99 ways, carry me breathless and be dazzled to happy birthday capers on sunny sand, watching Alice and Cindy wade in the water in mini skirts. A family story time, another rather lovely thing in the kitchenette, the fable of the brown ape, Mickey bloody mouse conversations. Lament rose in shivers, with one autumn memory of counting stars in the distant sky on a rainy night in Soho after the lightning bolts of fireworks over the river. And my rambling mind mixed memories of her red dress and the red clock, dolphins and a honeybee on the window, mermaids in the bath in the house beside the church and Tupelo. Hold on to yourself, I said over and over. Hold on to yourself. Falling into a well of misery can't do what must be done. And what must be done must be done. So farewell, my love. Let the bells ring goodbye and cry your death, nor your funeral is the end. Not so long as there, as there is a light in my sad, dark eyes. Thanks, Sam. You know, January was the month for being sad. We're, we're done with that now. Into spring. It's always light, as long as you're in the darkness. That's true. Um, next up, we have May Jeanette. Yes, welcome. I just like to start to say I'm, I'm, I'm new. Um, listening to all of you guys has, has been a process of intimidation and inspiration, <laughs> more intimidation. Now I think it's all just muddled into nervousness. <laughs> so um, I kind of just the kind of poetry I write is just on the spot. I take on my phone, I write it, don't give it too much thought, don't judge me too much. <laughs> Um, the poem I'll be reading tonight is called Sodad. If anyone who doesn't know, it's an emotional state of melancholic or profoundly nostalgic longing for beloved, yet absent that that's something, absent of that something or someone. It's often associated with a repressed understanding that one might never encountered, encounter the recipient of longing ever again. So this is my poem. Once I can find it. <laughs> hear ye, hear me. Please provide some patience as you read my missive. Try to keep an open mind with compassion as you're admissive. And treat your prejudices and preconceptions as dismissive. It is neither a plea nor a demand, not even a request, but I've, I've been emotionally capable. 
Even with salacious, soft whispers taunting that I'm implacable, emotionally incapable as they laugh at me. Yet I'm only human, I'm not great like Constantine. Unfortunately, I'm more of a libertine, with moral grey so pristine, its muddled mess makes for an interesting reflection. My woes and troubles serenade me when it is a real me I see in a smelted, seemingly melted, muddled mirror. Hear me when I say I ask not for your touch, but I have been branded. Though the Olympic flame burns not for me. So I guess I'll have to bask and bathe this smouldered brand of mine in this restless, relentless smog with my head spinning, my environment reeling and my heart feeling. I will laugh neurotically as I'm chemically, comically trying to grab smoke and smile with tearless silence, holding on to what only makes me sad as it fills me with its silence so that. <laughs> Thank you, Major. What a debut! Yeah. Well done. Thanks so much. Next up, we have Patricia Walsh. Thank you. This is called Speedway. Deserted by experience, following the thread, the dispense with explosion running deep, the old slatten burn not realized yet. Portraying the one-off event, still not likely, silent as the circumstances there on in. Now wanting on the uptake, stealing windows, excavating other sorrows, godlike control. Their interest lost in some, leave from the book, following the sentence into the common door, detailing the homespun wreckage of the till. Curtailing a mantra, revealing under its lips, Lifetime preferred by some if they can't do. Loving on probation more real than apparent. A ladylike declaration rolls the loaded dice. Screening the failed typology in a tightened nut. Fishing drinks come home. Suburban disgrace. Obsolete reckonings dance in your eyes. The flat footed bombings grow easier every year. Asking for a boat but a wiped clean slate. Fashionable dealing is not fair on anyone. Often the scrapes up through summer cleaning, jettisoning the vindictive, neighboring on, tracking the water paid for by, by your leave, the tri persuasion, the untidy profession, that complicated music doesn't want to catch cry. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Next up, can we get Fionn Rogan, please? Some of the themes in my five word poem for, foreshadowed my, my poem this evening. Um, I grew up in a small town in County Clare, and I didn't realize what a country bumpkin I was until I went to secondary school in Limerick City. And the, the title of this poem is a question I was asked when I started. In secondary school so if you if you know the limbic accent kind of tune into that but i won't do it are you a raver or a metler <laughs> my new classmates listened for an answer at 12 years i hadn't yet chosen a tribe adept in silence as survival i shrugged a non-reply one year later i brandished doc martens combat trousers and black t-shirts on uniform free fridays trading tapes with my new friends our voices and guitars detuned as we scrawled on our desks and textbooks the names of our favourite bands. Metallica, Hanthera, Deicide. Listening to you was like being stuck in caps lock for my teenage years. <laughs> <laughs> Headbanging my way through social situations, I kept hidden my inarticulate heart. A growth in shoe size, but not consciousness, despite hours analysing poems in English class. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, can we get Cedric Baker? Oh. 
That one doesn't have a title yet. I live in by myself, my mind, my muse, and I in a polyamory couple. <laughs> Overthinking a better life, thinking over a million wishes, bickering over who cooks, who washes the dishes. She lives in me, only comes at the worst times. Catches me in bed, committing those crimes. <laughs> she stares, lets the guilt set in, set in. And my mind, on her side, starts nagging. I could do better, be better. A creator, a friend, a man, and a lover. A support to the last hour. I want to cling to my shame, but she snatches that blade. He threatens me with the blame until the self-loathing is stayed. That's how, you, that's how this hostage work, situation goes. This and the rest is a household situation. Sorry. This and the rest is a household, house, household tradition between my mind, my muse, and me. Old friends, best foes. Cedric. Next up, can we get Alexandra Toth, please? Oh. So I wrote this poem about four years ago when I was around 16. At uh, that time, this poem I was actually very proud of. Now I criticize it because that was four years ago. I was 16, but like it does hold a special place in my heart. It's about um, a first heartbreak. Um, it's called Broken Wings. Broken spirit, broken wings. An angel silent cry since the moon has left her. Thought she could be saved from the suffering, but the absence of the moon slowly kills her. Time shall fix these broken wings, but slowly believing these words deceive her lonely soul. As the days pass and seasons change, she longs for the happiness lost lost in the past, searching deeper than the ocean itself for answers where the moon has left her, knowing the moon will never come back to shine a light again through her darkest nights, but the moon can't hear her silent cries. Thousand feelings swirl in me like the wind in a hurricane. The moment my eyes met yours, this broken angel cries inside. While she smiles, smiles hiding the pain disguised as a demon, Learning love has a price, a sacrifice, but this angel believes hope dies last. Thank you so much, Alexandra. And it's a bit of a double edged sword now because now that we know the barmaid's a poet, you'll never get rid of us at the end of the night. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, I missed the first one. Like You're minutes. ready to make. I'm proud of my I'm proud of the one that I read before. Now I wasn't even meant to stand up. I was like, Ah oh, no, God. it was great. It was great. Thank you. Next up, we're going to go with Antonio. Thanks and uh, congratulations to all the wonderful poets who came uh, be before me. So my poem is, is called uh, Perspective on the Bridge. Words never lie. An escape of two lovers on a bridge closing the eyes from the tiny punctures of the rain. A lamp as old guardian, lighthouse to the urban mariners who, who have lost their harbor. Echoes of lost songs, empty as the last two portions of McDonald's potato fries. Please do not cross the, the, the street 
outside the, the white stripes, stunning sunset on an unusual e evening, enough close to Parnell Place, considering uh, the few seagulls, the sentinels of the sky. I hold your hands, you eat the stars one by one, reclaiming the rising of the moon. The roofs will take the final shot, a per perspective on the bridge, looking for the next summer of the grief and the hot winter of a guilty pleasure. Thank you. Antonio. Next up, we have Lauren O'Donovan, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this poem was about a time over 10 years ago um, when I was going to UCC and I lived about 10 minutes over there and I worked next door in Web Workhouse and it's called Home. Remember when we lived at Summerhill South in that bungalow with the yellow walls and concrete floors the landlord dug up to trace a leak, opening the arteries of the house and creating canals for us to leap over on the way to the toilet at two in the morning. The first night in our room, we couldn't get to sleep because of loud people stumbling home from pubs, leaning on each other or into the heat of an argument until the buses rose at dawn, rumbling out of the depot and shaking our single pane windows in the frame. It was in that house I quit my job by text message in the morning from bed. <laughs> the job my dad had got for me teaching English to Spanish students. The same house that Frankie sold hash out of and we all smoked too much to keep our ghosts quiet. The house where we broke up for the first time at Halloween on the way home from freak scene after that American girl from college vomited green <laughs> tequila all over the dance floor. <laughs> but the next day, neither of us could recall what was said, only how we made each other feel. And about a year after we moved out, remember, we met those lads in the club who invited us back to their gaff but it turned out it was our house at Summerhill South, except the floor was fixed under new thick carpets. The walls were all repainted white and our bedroom was now a brand new living room with a new couch that didn't eat you or have nodge burns in the arms. They welcomed us in those lads who had stolen our life without realizing. But as I sat in our old bedroom, the party pulsing, I couldn't breathe and my stomach started swinging. So I scrambled over all the strange legs and burst out the front door. You followed, phone out, ready to call a taxi saying, do you want to go home? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron, love it. Um, so we have two readers left um, and if if you haven't read and you think maybe maybe I will actually, um, then you're more than welcome to after that. Um, so our penultimate reader is Billy Ramsell. Thanks, Mel. Um, this poem, I'm, gonna, I'm working on it at the moment, and it's written in the voice of um, uh, a Catalan poet called Alberto, Alberto Senas. And in this poem, he brings a clock to be repaired to a clock shop. Um, the clockmaker is Senor Armignol. And you can find the clock shop on Calle Corsega in Barcelona, if you want. Corsica Street. Uh, the poem is called well, I don't know actually, but it might be something to do with clock. <laughs> Fundamentals of clockwork? But, sorry. So, I hand her mantel clock to Senor Armignol. It's unreliable, 
my mother insists. For several months now, it's been keeping poor time. It's a cake of porcelain and privilege. Yadro limited late 1970s, the deck with petals, with cupids arrogantly hovering. But how pitiable it looks, poor clock. One senior Armignol slides its back panel off, suffering such exposure, its innards, its vulnerable workings all on view. Senior Armignol puts his thin, ingenious finger to the pendulum, retarding it just so, or nudging it delicately into the future. He addresses the slow, bewildering nest of clicking gears, sets his pin vice to the driving weight, tempers the anchor in an act of grace and balance. I'm winding down. Oh, clocks, there is no need to deny it. For several years now, I've been keeping poor time. One senses it, deep in one's person, sundry, wet and nameless mechanisms, chugging, chugging, engaging ever more grudgingly. Oh, clocks that gong through this atelier, oh, cuckoo clocks spun with ridicule, Grandfather clocks at the ready with mahogany pronouncements. Oh, clocks, dear clocks, deny it. Don't confirm for me that I'm lagging further and further behind the world. Tell me it's the world that needs adjusting. <laughs> and I'll finish yet. I was thinking about ending it there, but I'm going to add in another verse, right? Like, I thought I had to bring back the guy. But maybe that's not the right thing to do. I don't know. You never know. Like, bring it back. Go on. Senor Armignol, with decisive screws, restores our clock's back panel. He besets me with a level stare, his judgment unsparing, perhaps, but accurate to the second. He tuts and sighs. Oh, the clock man. He sees deep into each mechanism. Oh, the clock man knows what time it is. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Billy. Was was that our first time seeing a, like a freestyle verse <laughs> at the end? It wasn't freestyle. I wouldn't put it past you. I wouldn't put it past you. No. Finally, or maybe not finally, depending on how you feel, we have Sublu, please. Thanks very much. Um, before I kick off with my poem, I would like to um, invite whoever, um, as in we have three more places left for next week's first Blue Mondays in-person meeting since. So we are meeting here, actually, this will be our new home. Uh, on every third Monday of the month, 6 to 9 p.m. Um, but we can only have 10 people in the room. Um, so it's workshopping, it's not audience. And there are three more places on the list. And I'll need those names until the Sunday before um, next Monday. So until Sunday 19th. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for that uh, plug-in. And I shall read my poem, which it was actually uh, prompted by a UCC prompt for, like, was it an anthology or something? Um, I didn't get into it, but I, I still like this poem. Blue is the color of distance. Ice gleams like a palace beyond the endless white, refracting golden light. The attraction of remotest distance in the cold blue of reflected skies. Corroding the need for heat, it rheumatizes tele telescopic elbows to miss the stretch for embrace, curl back to painful source and hold the breath of the cold. Alone within and without, blue is the color of distance. We freeze and hug ourselves 
avert our eyes from gleaming ice to soothe the solar pain burning. Skin glistens icicle blue, the breath stands frozen still, no more longing for remoteness, arms held out to hollow emptiness, blue is the cutting of human ties. Thanks, Sue. Um, have we got anybody else that would like to read a poem? Fergus. Fergus, go for it. Bless. Uh, this is oldish, and I uh, I had forgotten it, and then I conjured it up again recently, and um, I realised I liked it. <laughs> So this one is called Conversation with the Vampire, not to be confused with Interview with the Vampire, which is a novel by Anne Rice and was turned into an Oscar-winning movie by Neil Jordan and starred Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Christian Slater, Antonio Banderas, and all the way from Belfast, Stephen Ray. But that's got nothing to do with my story, so take all those images out of your head right now. I wouldn't like you to be confused, and also I wouldn't like Neil Jordan ringing me up in the morning calling me a plagiarist because I don't like being called a plagiarist in the morning, it's way too early for me. So if you're ready, here it goes. It's the um. It's the, uh, the special director's cut, actually. This is box set, Blu-ray edition, HD ready, 3D ready. Are you ready for conversation with the vampire? In 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8, I was living alone in cold, freezing, rented accommodation, waking up in the middle of the night, freezing cold, all on my own, contemplating living for the rest of my life in cold, freezing, rented accommodation. So, I went into my bank and I said, any chance of a small mortgage for a small house with maybe a small shade of like, we don't do things like that. He said, we only do big mortgages for two or many more, we get four houses, use your head, he said. Get 20 beds, throw them into a house with 20 foreign fellows, 20 of their sisters, they'll pay the mortgage for you, cop yourself on, oh, think like a banker, excuse me, I said. I do not want to think like you. I do not want to live like a vampire, I said. If I was a vampire, I said, I'd retire. I'd be like Brad Pitt, I said. I'd live in a chicken shack. I'd suck on rats, but I don't want to be a vampire, active or retired. I came in here, I said, looking for a small mortgage, for a small house, or maybe a small shed out the back. Well, do you know what? I said, I've changed my mind. I don't want the shed. Heaven forbid, I said. I'd wake up some morning, look out the back, and find Brad Pitt living in my shed with vampires sucking on rats. <laughs> I do not want Brad Pitt living in my shed, I said. And I refuse, absolutely refuse to have Tom Cruise anywhere near my shed. That fellas off his head. I saw Cruise interviewed on Oprah, I've heard his views. He believes we are descended from aliens. Aliens, I said, for God's sake. Bad enough having Brad in the shed with the vampires and the rats and crews pouncing around doing cartwheels acting the crap while I draw the lines aliens in my shed. I've got standards, I said. And so has the Health and Safety Officer of North Tipperary County Council. He'd have my Leroy D in a sling for that. He'd be up on my back reading me the riot act about multiple breaches of the Health and Safety Act. And quite frankly, I've got enough shite in my life without that. I came in here, I said, looking for a small mortgage for a small house with maybe a small shed out the back. A small shed, I said. Not an intergalactic shed. <laughs> Not some place for Tom Cruise to entertain his friends from outer space. Not some handy outside location for Neil Jordan to shoot some iffy adaptation starring for the umpteenth time, Stephen Ray again. Looking all lost and confused again. I do not want Stephen Ray looking lost and confused in my shade. I came in here, I said, looking for a small mortgage, for a small house, or maybe a small shed out the back. Forget it, I said. Forget it. I don't want the mortgage. 
I don't want the house and I sure as hell do not want a shed that's so jam-packed you can't even swing a cat with Pete making no sense whatsoever talking to his top hat to Christian Slater telling him no end of cock and bull stories about hanging out with colonies of vampires sucking on colonies of rats with a colony of aliens hanging out of the rafters in pods been entertained by Tom the Lula Cruz <laughs> and the health and safety officer from North Tipperary giving me dog's abuse and Stephen, God help us Ray, looking all lost and confused and Antonio, I'm so absolutely gorgeous, Banderas, wearing a red Ridiculous pawn shop Halloween wig that even a two-year-old child could not possibly believe was real. And Neil, I'm so deep. Jordan, being all introspective and subjective with a camera up his yim-yam, making mythical movies about inner conflict and ambiguous identity. Oh, for God's sake, I said that. Shed was meant for me, <laughs> and only me, to do things with myself in privacy. Do I have to spell that what I said? <laughs> privacy without half the galaxy looking at me without Jordan shouting out action every time I go out into my shed without the master of metaphor making hidden meaning movies of me with my alter ego hanging out and beaming the pictures of the planet Zog I do not want to be the first interplanetary skin flick superstar with pictures of me being beamed far out into space I do not want to disgrace my mother, I said. She's 91. 91, I said. She's never seen an intergalactic skin flick. And I don't <laughs> want her to see one. Sure as hell do not want her to see her son starring in one with my alter ego hanging out. And I definitely do not want to be voted number one on the late night arty farty movie charts up on Planet Zog. Who do you take me for at all? I said, obviously, you have one serious problem with your ears. You have not heard one single word I said. I said, well, listen to me now. Listen to me good. Get it through your blood-sucking, money-lending head. I came in here looking for a small mortgage, <laughs> for a small house with maybe a small shed out the back. Cancel that, I said, completely. <laughs> Just give me a tiny, tiny, tiny term loan. I'll buy me a one-man tent instead. I've got principles, I said, and I walked out of there not long after that with my head held high. And in my pocket, I had enough money to buy me a small country and half a dozen housing estates. And that... My friends, is what makes this country consider myself a poet but my boyfriend tends to tell me all the time I am so he's probably right <laughs> so, um this one's called home and it goes I made the mistake of telling both myself and the people around me that you felt like home to me which at the time was very true you did genuinely feel like home to me although growing up home for me was a place to be fearful in it was a place where walking around on eggshells to avoid conflict was normal it was a place I wanted to get away from rather than somewhere I would love to be it was a place filled with tears, screaming, slammed doors, objects being broken and thrown around. 
It was unsupportive and not very loving. It felt normal to me to not want to come home. It felt it was normal for me to feel anxious because I would never know what awaited me at home. So yes, you felt like home to me. I would mistake that as a good thing, a good sign that it was good for us to be together. In the end, that was never the case. I only realized that when I was laying in his arms and I was thinking to myself how safe I felt, how I was never walking around on eggshells to avoid conflict and how I never once was ever fearful of him. It was, it was peaceful, loving and safe, which made me think of the sentence, I would say you feel like home to me, but unlike home, you've always felt safe to me, which in turn made me realize that the times I felt like you were home was never a good thing. You didn't feel safe, loving or peaceful. You felt just like the home that was so scary to me. You felt like the home where I could never relax because I would forever be on high alert. So I'm glad he doesn't feel like home to me because I wouldn't want him to. I want him to feel like the home I never had, the home that is safe, loving, peaceful and supportive. The home that I can't wait to get back to every single time, which is exactly how it is. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Was that another debut? Yeah. Was it? Yes. Yes. Anyone else among you? Think so. No. Or Shane. Yes. Another day. Yeah. I wasn't going to, but now I am. So um, this poem is um, about hanging on to something, clutching on to something that should be well gone. It's called Inside Pocket. I do not wear it now, his coat. Within the oxblood lining, there is an inside pocket, and in it I hide his voice. I used to slip my fingers in and take it out, watch the soft palate undulating, enunciating the misshapen words he once gave me. I would hold it up to my ear, hear its bending rhythm, its pace as steady as a shovel slicing earth. I placed it under my nose once, inhaled its sound. Its smell lay somewhere between pipe, tobacco and honey, suckle scented rain. But I wanted more his tone, his fluency, his articulation. To feel the rush of air through his vocal cords, for my voice to become his. So I pushed it into my mouth. It sat there, balanced on my tongue for a moment before my throat tickled, then Tightened, I tried to swallow, but only stuttered. My mouth gaped open like an unfilled grave. Before the words let and go plummeted out. Caught for breath, I coughed it up. It landed on the floor, broken. I do not wear it now his coat. Within the ox blood lining, there is an inside pocket, and in it I hide his voice stitched shut. Unless anyone runs and tackles me. Oh, Jim, yeah. Jim, yeah. run and tackle me. Come on. <laughs> it's all happening now. <laughs> um, I haven't read this in years, but it's, um, I don't know, it's kind of cute. Uh, it's called On Being a Vampire. Oh, yeah. 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 God. Yeah. I came out when I was 45 years old. <laughs> I was tired of keeping beauty secrets. You too can have eternal youth if you've got money for Botox. 
or if you sell your soul off to Satan, who is a cross-dresser, who stitches pure white souls together and wears them for a living chiffon gown that howls and raises eyebrows all around the seven circles of hell. When I told my mother she insisted on Christian conversion camp, my eyes rolled so hard I could see God. <laughs> It was then I decided to say that I also like men. I moved to the Lower East Side, where nobody notices vampires. I got a studio apartment and became very depressed. I found company on Grindr, invited one guy over for Netflix and chill. We lay down in the dimly lit room, light poured from the laptop playing nothing, nothing hill. When I smelled the rust of his blood, it was Netflix and kill. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, shame rained on me. I had nowhere to turn. I decided on Alcoholics Anonymous. The only requirement is a desire to stop drinking. <laughs> Plus, their blood smells terrible. <laughs> I shared that it's easy to be lonely when your friends are human. An old black lady, mm-hmm, in recognition. We talked over coffee in styrofoam cups. I heard it works if you work it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. You're the gift that keeps on giving, like, so is there anyone else? <laughs> That's what the open mic list is there for, guys. It's a break. Like, no, this is good. This is more fun. Um, honestly, though, is, is there anything else that would like to read? Hold on. Right. Oh, would you Thanks, do one? Friend. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Um, I, I actually won't myself, but I will plug in a reading soon that uh, we'll be doing with Fergus Costello this Wednesday in Maureen's Bar for Sling Slang. Yeah, it's going to be great. My poetry is nothing like his. We'll balance each other out well, I'm sure. Uh, and there's another opportunity for an open mic there as well. So uh, do come along to that if you'd like to share more poems. It's um, this Wednesday in Maureen's from half 7.30. So, and yeah, the capacity is probably even lower than this room. So if, if you are going to come, you will be turned away for, you know, Health and safety reasons, but in fairness, but it's a it's a bad feeling to be on your way to the poetry night and being told you can't come in. It's awful. We we need bigger bigger venues. Um. So guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna close it up now. Um. Next, the next avail is March thirteenth, where we have jo jo Jody Hollander and Adam Wyatt. Um. And I want to thank everybody. I think we had about twenty over twenty one readers on the open mic. Over 24 on the Fiber Challenge. Congratulations to our winner of that, Jim Crickard. Um, and thanks, thanks again, everybody who read and everybody who attended tonight. And a special thanks to our readers from the MA Creative Writing Course in UCC. Um, and as, as per usual, uh, to cap off our 681st Ovale, uh, we will go to Mains for maybe a glass of wine, a cup of tea, a bit of cheese, whatever you fancy. Um, so see you there and see you next month. Thanks very much. <laughs>